Hello and welcome to the Witch Hunter podcast. I am your host, Domin. Witch Hunter is an epic gothic fantasy adventure, and today we bring to you the next chapter in the saga. I know some people have been wondering about that strange accent of mine, and they want to find out where I'm from. Well, actually, I am from Belgium. More specifically, Antwerp in the northern half of Belgium, where the language is Flemish, which is a kind of Dutch, so that is my native language. And I wish you all a very fine day in my ursprungliche taal bij deze. As I have mentioned several times before, actually on every episode I think, Witch Hunter is also available in its entirety as a USB flash drive, cleverly disguised as a cassette tape, and also as a download. Follow the links in the show notes to find where you can get the entire story. If you prefer to read, the novel is also available on Amazon, both in printed format and as an ebook. And if you have any questions or comments for us, well, just send them to our Audio Epics Facebook page or uh, type a comment in Podbean or send me an email. My address is d, the letter d, dot de, dot groot, that's g r double o t at audio hyphen epics dot com so d dot d dot groot at audio hyphen epics dot com and now i will just leave you with the next epic chapter of witch hunter silva domus Despite his haste, Doctor still took the time to prepare a bag of provisions. It contained twisted yellow roots from a faraway land, which he claimed were ideal food for on the road. He also included two flasks filled with a strange blue fluid that would serve as liquid meals. It would be enough to last them a few days, but by then they would be utterly sick of both the roots and the liquid. Bloodlove mounted his horse. Samina hugged Dr. Tight, causing him to blush, then hopped on in front of Ludlov. With a tip of his hat, the witch hunter said goodbye to the old healer. Doctor responded with a terribly executed military salute. It was such an endearing sight that Ludlov found himself smiling despite everything. Then he turned his horse and left, riding east. Ludlov cantered the horse past the outskirts, and with that civilization was behind them. Rugged terrain followed, full of jagged, moss-covered rocks and thorny bushes. This continued for ten miles to the western edge of the vast wildwood. Ludlov had been in the wildwood before, but never for long. He had fought off a witch there once, a truly perverted being who lived in a hollow tree from whence he enacted the vile sort of magic. Angry at the world for her lonely and rejected life, she had taken to the habit of luring beautiful maidens to her tree, where she used to feed them whatever they desired. Or so it had seemed to her victims, for her food had been an illusion, poison in disguise. It had turned the maidens into monsters, unrecognizable from their original form. In the end, Ludlov had slain the witch, but some of her victims still lived in the woods too ashamed of their appearance to return to their villages. The whole experience had been so harrowing it had made him want to avoid the wildwood whenever he could. They were both quiet on the way. Ludlov felt no need to ask Semina what her plan was. He trusted she would make it clear to him and it would be worth the journey. That trust surprised him, because he hadn't known anything like it for a long time. But it felt good. It was perhaps the only thing that felt good in these frightening days. When they reached the borders of the forest, the horse held still, and a peaceful quiet came over Ludlov. Supported by the careless singing of birds high up in the beaches, The wind was still, and the sound of the horse's hooves pressing down on the crunching twigs and whispering dead leaves sounded bright and clear. The smell of autumn suddenly brought with it memories of long, carefree evenings by the hearth. A different time. 
a different Lidlov. They continued on, and as they rode deeper into the woods, their surroundings started to change. The trees huddled closer together, and high bushes became more prevalent, making it harder to find the way. The ground, which had been flat so far, began to slope, and often Ludlov's horse had to take winding paths to avoid pits or impenetrable parts. Gnarly roots stuck out from the ground, and the foliage became so dense that the light of the sun was almost lost. Hours passed, and then the witch hunter halted his horse, taking in his surroundings. It was like they were at the borders of another world. The trees, both stately deciduous trees and towering firs, were unusually lean and dark, with branches that looked like grasping claws. The forest canopy was so thick that the failing light of the sun only occasionally shone through. It was late in the afternoon, and the light wouldn't last much longer. Ludlov was sure that it would be pitch black before they would have any chance of returning out of the wildwood. He hated to admit it even to himself, but he felt slightly afraid. I assume there's a specific place in the woods you're trying to lead me to? In which case, I hope this is still the right direction. What's your horse's name? Ludlov didn't know. He had stolen the horse from the city guards. I'll call him Boris, he said, thinking of the first horse he had ever owned. Staith Boris. Ye hea wealt. Hea erba, Semina said softly, patting the horse's neck. The horse nickered and bowed his head to eat the grass between the roots and the moss of the forest floor. Ludlov dismounted. His heavy boots made a dull splashing sound on the soggy ground. Samina jumped from the horse with effortless elegance. It was almost impossible to believe she had been on the verge of dying from a shot wound the night before. It startled Ludlov when he realized he had no idea what had triggered her miraculous improvement. Could it have been Doctor? Might he have been more than just a gifted healer? Or was it Samina herself? Just how strong was she really when it came to that magic of hers? He studied the girl's movements. She seemed almost childlike in her carefree manner, breathing in the smell of the woods, enjoying the place so much she made a little dance that had her stained white dress twirl cheerfully around her legs. Her bare feet didn't mind the dirty soil, full of sharp twigs and pebbles. She was facing away from him, but she must have suddenly felt his surprised gaze, because she turned to him, smiling and tilting her head questioningly. What's wrong, Ludlov? Is the mighty witch hunter ill at ease in the big scary woods? He loved the woods, even though he lived in the city. He just didn't care for these woods too much. Still, he decided not to respond. Semina's look turned serious again. We've arrived. This is the place. Ludlov looked around and saw nothing unique about this part of the woods until he directed his gaze upwards. Nestled in the crown of an ancient oak, there was a moldy old tree house. The simple construction was dilapidated, but it was still there. This is where my brother and I used to flee from the adult world. It's a very nice treehouse, Ludlov said, though he didn't mean it in the slightest. It was a dispiriting wreck of crooked wooden boards, poorly nailed together and stained with slimy green mildew. <laughs> Not quite, I know, but it was a special place to me, and it still is. Then she suddenly stopped laughing and became very still, eyeing the treehouse nervously. Ludlov could tell she was very concerned about something. I... I may confide in you now, Ludlov. If I do, then I hope, I pray that you will not break my trust. Ludlov had nothing to say in reply. Semina stood quietly for a moment and then took a step towards the treehouse as if she was hoping to find a solution for her dilemma there. In the end, she just sighed and looked him in the eye intently. I have no choice, do I? She took a deep breath and held it in for a moment. 
Ludlow remained stoic as he awaited the revelation she was about to share with him. My brother Sigurd is an infiltrator in the Black Sickle. Ludlow immediately felt a fire welling up in his heart at those words, but he managed to maintain an aloof composure. An infiltrator? Yes, I suppose you could say he's a sort of witch hunter too. He couldn't believe it. An untrained gypsy magician infiltrating the darkest cult the city had ever known since the days of Gunther Orf. Is your brother an idiot? Samina looked at him, shocked and hurt, but he couldn't keep himself from continuing. Did he honestly think a lad like him had even the smallest chance of surviving an operation like that? The Black Sickle is no joke, Samina. Silver tears welled up in Samina's eyes. At the sight of those, Ludlow refrained himself. Once more, he had gone too far. I'm sorry. Do you really think I didn't try to tell him just the same thing? Do you think I didn't do everything in my power to change his mind? Well, I did, Ludlow. I did. One morning he was just gone. Mother and I... <laughs> she put the palm of her hand in front of her lips and simply shook her head as a silver tear rolled down her cheek. Ludlow watched, paralyzed by shame. He suddenly realized something. She had only just narrowly avoided being executed and survived a shot wound and all this while dealing with the death of her mother, the disappearance of her brother and complete uncertainty of the fate of all her friends in the city. And the minute before, she had been dancing. He had a sudden glimpse of the terrible burden that Samina had to have been carrying this whole time. Realizing this, he felt a deep shame over the way he had been treating her just now. But more powerfully, he felt a great admiration for her. This simple gypsy girl displayed more strength, more wisdom and more restraint than he could muster after all his years of training. He couldn't watch as she buried her face in her hands and let the tears flow. Instead, he went over to hold her as he had done at Doctor's Shack. She wept for minutes, and all this time Ludlow didn't know what else to do than just keep her close to him and caress her dark hair. Eventually, she took a step back. She was shaking as she spoke. It's all right. I'm so sorry, Samina. I was blind. She dismissed his apology with a wave of her hand and said no more. Then she turned to the treehouse again. Do you think you will find something there? Ludlow was relieved to be able to ask a practical question. Samina shot him a glance and without further words, she dashed to the tree and started climbing it. With supple grace, she made her way up the trunk in moments without effort. Again, Ludlow found himself wondering, was that magic? He had seen stranger things, of course. He had met countless creatures of the night that had moved along walls like insects. But he had never seen a mortal human being do anything like this and make it look so natural. When she had arrived in the treehouse, she knelt, looking for something. She was largely out of his line of sight now, so Ludlow didn't know what she was doing. A minute later, she descended again, carrying a roll of parchment in her hand. I found it! She sat down between two massive tree roots. Ludlow couldn't understand how she could so blithely ignore all the dirt and moss. He sat down more carefully on one of the roots, taking a look at the bit of parchment. It was rather flimsy. A message? Yes, it is. Samina spoke with full certainty, waiting for a bit before unrolling it, like she was savoring the moment. This is a place where we agree to leave messages to each other. We kept in touch for a while after he left, even though I don't have many opportunities to leave the city. I haven't heard from him in two months now. I've backed him before in my messages to tell me where I could find him, but he's always refused to do that. I hope that the Magicide Act has prompted him to write me something. He must know how worried I am. Ludlow didn't doubt that the members of the Black Sickle precisely belonged to the few magic users who didn't have anything to fear from the Magicide Act. As deeply as he hated them, he would not underestimate them. 
true evil was intelligent, and beyond any doubt it would always be one step ahead of blunt straightforward measures like the magicide, no matter how sweeping and extreme. At this point, that was probably, ironically, the one thing that might be keeping Samina's brother safe from harm. Sometimes he tells me about his duties for the Black Sickle. He doesn't know much about their activities, but he has known for a while that they've been planning something huge. The fire. Samina didn't answer, so he assumed she agreed. Then she took a deep breath and unrolled the parchment. Ludlov saw Samina's puzzled frown and went to take a look at the note for himself. There was only one line on it. Sister, sister, you will know. What is that? Samina shrugged, still staring at the words. It's from a little rhyme he used to say to me. Ludlov scratched his chin. This has to be a riddle of some sort. Do you remember how the rhyme goes? Samina smiled a little. <laughs> of course I do. He used to pester me with it all the time when he stole my dolls and hid them from me. Sister, sister, you will know when you sing and when you blow. That's an odd little rhyme. And then he proceeded to goad me into singing and blowing at once. If I did, he would return my doll to me. It was complete silliness. She was shaking her head exasperatedly, but her eyes lit up at the memories. Clearly he wants you to do it again. Obviously. I'm curious to hear your song blow. Oh, it's very spectacular. You're in for a real treat, witch hunter. Cover your ears. She focused on the parchment, pursed her lips and made a sound that reminded Ludlov of nothing he knew except perhaps the lowest notes on a flute. It was quite charming to witness. The words on the paper faded away and the full letter appeared instead. Well, well. Your brother is a mage indeed. Then Ludlov saw Samina clasping the letter nervously and kept quiet while she read. Dear Samina, I'm so sorry about Mother. I'm sorry I didn't write to you when she became ill. I'm sorry I couldn't be there when she died. I'm sorry for everything. Know that I carry her and you in my heart, here in this darkest of places. I want to send you news more often, but there is much risk involved. Nobody suspects I do this, and I have to keep it that way. I hope this message finds you quickly, though. I know that you are on the run, and that there is a witch hunter with you who is similarly fugitive. Yes, the eyes of the Black Sickle are everywhere. Trust Ludlov. He wants to expose the Black Sickle as much as I do. Make sure he knows that the city is full of people looking for you. The only reason you are both still alive is the teacher. He has a plan for you. The worst is yet to come, Samina. Go to the ghost streets. Ludlov clenched his teeth and squeezed his fists. Despite his efforts, he had still underestimated the Black Sickle. He should have been more careful. He could only pray that he hadn't left a trail to Doctor and to the Wildwood, but he was becoming unsure of himself. And then this teacher. No doubt Sigurd had referred to the same monster that had come to disrupt the mayor's dinner party. That creature, or man, or whatever it was, had to be the mind behind the Black Sickle. Which meant... The Magicide Act. Samina was already rereading the letter, ignoring him and losing herself in this precious token of her brother. No doubt she was delighted that he was still alive. This letter had to have been planted here very recently, perhaps even today. How Sigurd had done that... Ludlov had no idea, but a much bigger thought was on his mind now. The Black Sickle, Samina. The Black Sickle. They are the ones who have instigated the Magicide Act. They want all magicians dead. She finally turned to him. What? Why? What would that accomplish? What do they want? 
I've been trying to find the answer to that question for the past seven years. There's only one person who can help us find the answer now. Your brother. She nodded, satisfied that their goals were aligned. He says that we need to go to the ghost streets. The ghost streets. The one place where no citizen of Seven Peaks would ever venture willingly. It was a gigantic chasm that split the northern half of the city in two. Some rumors held that the chasm was actually bottomless. Others said that there was another city there, inhabited by spirits that fed on the darkness from below. That's where the name came from. Nobody would ever want to go down and explore that place. Go to the ghost streets. Silence fell between the two of them. Ludlow thought of the prospect of going to that place. It was a daunting task indeed. Not only would they have to return into the city where a genocide was being waged, where Ludlow and Semino were both wanted fugitives, and where the ultimate hidden enemy would be watching their every move from afar. They also would have to find some way to gain access to a horrific place no one had ever gone to and returned. He didn't even know if it was possible to reach the bottom of that chasm at all. It was utterly impossible. Too stupid even to consider. It was the sort of thing from those ridiculous stories told by... Suddenly he knew what to do. I know a man who can tell us how to find the way to the ghost streets. Samina looked at him hopefully. Really? Who? A sad little smile appeared on Ludlow's lips. Gustav Finsterdunkel. We made camp in the Wildwood and stayed there for the night. When morning came, we ate some of our provisions and returned to Doctor's shack in the outskirts. When we arrived, we found the neighborhood to be strangely quiet. There was no trace of the usual crowd of beggars and children in the street. I assumed that most of the inhabitants had followed Doctor to safety. Death gave Ludlow a look that made him stop his tale. The timeless man sighed. None of them made it, Ludlow. Such a short message. Such simple words. None of them made it. How could five little words bash down on him like the stroke of a great hammer? Voices and faces appeared before him. Toothless old men. Stern, practical women. Frightened children. He closed his eyes, hoping to hide from them, but it did nothing. They didn't cry out to him or even see him. But he felt deeply connected to them all. The witch hunters found him on the road to the caves. In a way, Doctor's plan saved you and Samina Ludlov. The witch hunters were sure they would find both of you among them. Without their diversion... The outskirts would have been crawling with Inquisitors when you came back from the Wildwood. The faces lingered before Ludlow. Where are they now? Elsewhere. Beyond. Ludlow tried to find some measure of comfort in those words, but the weight of guilt was too great for him to bear, and it still hovered over his heart. He clenched his teeth and tried to ban that feeling, Guilt was useless. Anger would be better. Death seemed to be studying Ludlow's inner turmoil. He didn't say anything to comfort him, nor did he ask him to continue his story. He just sat there, peacefully. Strangely enough, Ludlow experienced Death's mild-mannered patience as an antidote for his own clash of emotions. He didn't understand how it was possible... But the quietly content demeanor of this eternal figure somehow gave a renewed sense of balance and strength to him. It was his task to continue his tale. And so he would do it. He took a deep breath. Samina told me I should set Boris free. I reluctantly complied. Then she whispered something in his ear, and he nickered once and galloped back into the direction of the Wildwood. 
I felt weakened without a ride, but it was for the best. After all, there was only one way for us to enter the city unnoticed. Only one way. Through the sewers. The sewage of Seven Peaks left the city from the northwest in a rusty-colored stream that wound its way down from the rocks further to the north, beyond Seven Peaks, where it eventually joined the Great River Venom. The man-sized drainage pipe in the city walls would have been the perfect entryway for Ludlow and Semina, if only it hadn't been barred both horizontally and vertically. There was no one to be seen when they arrived at this forlorn location. Ludlove inspected the bars, trying to find some way to get past them. They were as thick as Samina's wrists and set immovably in the stone. They were close enough that even Samina wouldn't be able to slip through them. He sighed in frustration. What had seemed like a perfectly nice entry plan was starting to look hopeless. Maybe my magic can help. Magic would undoubtedly draw the attention of their many enemies, but if there was no other option... Perhaps... Stand aside then, witch hunter. Samina gestured impatiently until Ludlov had taken several steps away from the drain pipe. Then she closed her eyes and aimed both hands to the obstacle, uttering a single word. Yeah. It was quiet for a bit. Samina's hair was caught in a breeze, but her body remained still as a statue. Ludlov didn't dare to disturb her concentration. The small hairs on his arms and in the back of his neck stood up, and he felt an electrifying sensation. The unmistakable presence of magical activity. He observed patiently as Samina's arms began to tremble with exertion. She suddenly looked much older frowning and clenching her teeth. He let his gaze go to the bars, hoping to see some sort of change, but they still looked massive and immobile. Still, he decided to remain quiet and wait. Then he thought he could see a soft red glow. It came from one of the bars themselves and soon spread to the ones next to it. The glow became stronger and brighter, and a few moments later, all the bars had lit up. Then Ludlov saw a wisp of smoke rising from them. Samina opened her eyes and gave the obstacle an estimating glance. Then she closed her eyes again and spoke a new word. Fria! She had uttered that word quickly and forcefully, like an angry insult. Then she shook, as if some unseen wave passed through her and out of her, rattling her so much she almost fell down. Ludlov was about to rush to her when a hellishly loud cracking distracted him. He looked to the bars and saw a glistening layer of ice on them. Samina staggered, but managed to remain upright. Try to open it again, Ludlov. Ludlov went towards her and held her up. I'm all right. Quickly. You don't have much time. Ludlov positioned himself in front of the bars. He pulled in his right leg and then kicked the bars as hard as he could with the entire sole of his boot. The bars didn't bend. They shattered in a hundred crystalline shards clattering down like broken glass onto the rocky ground. Now the dark tunnel lay before them like the gaping maw of some huge monster, with the broken remnants of the bars looking like the monster's jagged and irregularly shaped teeth. Ludlov was astounded. He found himself staring at the young witch like an idiot. In all his years, he had never seen anything quite like this. Then he noticed how weak and frail Samina looked, leaning breathlessly against the wall. Small trick. Much... Energy. Samina. He went to her and held her in his arms. She was so spent, she hardly seemed to notice him. He gently lowered himself into a sitting position against the city wall, laying her down beside him, using his lap as her pillow. 
Her otherwise gleaming dark hair suddenly looked dull, and she trembled, but at least she still had color in her face. Still, he was reminded of that terrible night when the mayor's bullet had almost killed her, and he had to fight back a sense of rising panic. She closed her eyes and started to breathe more slowly. He stroked her hair, allowing her to fall asleep. She had gone too far, given too much of herself, far too much. She could have died for all he knew. A foolish girl. Don't do that again, Samina. Never do that again. Never. She smiled. Well, well. Is the mighty witch hunter losing his nerve? Lady Hoskiv sat on a chair beside the massive bed. She was alone with Cardinal Falkenberg. Outside, it was an average overcast Seven Peaks day. In different weather, in turbulent times. In here, the window latches were closed and the curtains drawn. Only the soft light of candles lit the quiet room. The cardinal looked so small, the lady thought. He was a shrunken creature, delicate and brittle. His chest rose and fell in an irregular pattern of breath. Each time he inhaled, it was a loud and raspy sound. Then he seemed to be holding on to that breath, letting it go slowly and reluctantly, unwilling to release its life force just yet. She felt pity for him as she beheld him. The mightiest man in the civilized world was now reduced to an insect struggling for its life. The Grand General's mind wandered again as he absently regarded those wide, unseeing eyes aimed at the ceiling of the bedroom. She had been sitting there in silence for at least an hour. Maybe she was wasting her time. Maybe Gorlivosk would fail in his pursuit of Ludlov and she would have to take command herself. Maybe the last remaining work for the Magicide Act demanded her attention more than a dying man. But still she felt she had to be here. After all, he might just speak before the end. Perhaps he was now beyond rational thought, but certainly a few hours ago he had been fully aware of the fragility of the city. The cardinal had recounted the misfortunes himself. A dead mayor, a witch-hunter order compromised by the betrayal of its best member, and worst of all, worst of all, the end of the sacred stones and the return of Lucas within sight. And yet still he had adamantly refused to name a successor, or explain why he so fervently intended to be the last cardinal of Seven Peaks. It was probably too late now. The man was entering the final moments of his life. His rigid pose, his labored failing breath and especially his eyes betrayed it. Fixed, unblinking and wide with relentless terror, those eyes no longer reflected the candlelight. The sight of death had become a fact of life to Lady Hoskiv. There had been a time when she had been horrified at it. Innocent days long gone. She didn't miss them. Innocence had its virtues, but also a time and a place. The weight of responsibility she carried on her shoulders had long since crushed it. But in its place now stood a noble and elevated task one for which she would pay any price. Still, she thought of the price she had made others pay, and something deep inside of her winced. Her words and deeds in these terrible last few days had certainly been gruesome. She had sent thousands to their deaths. How many more would be left, bereft of their loved ones? How many children had she ordered to be orphans? Not thinking about it would be a weak and hypocritical response. So she forced herself to remain constantly aware of her choices. What she had done needed to be done. She told herself again. 
The Magicide Act, no matter how horrible, had been her responsibility and she would not forsake it. History will forgive us, she had told Ludlove. But the dead will not had been his reply. But Lady Hoskiv did not expect forgiveness from the dead. She expected the safety of the people of Seven Peaks, and if she would have to be removed from the goddess throughout eternity to achieve that goal, she would accept that fate and not regret her choices. Yet a part deep inside of her hoped that the goddess would indeed understand and forgive her. But whenever such thoughts arose, she squashed them. Deal with the here and now, she told herself. The afterlife will take care of itself. She did feel something gnawing at her, though. Something didn't sit well and made her feel uneasy and ashamed about the Magicide Act. By now, she had decided those feelings didn't come from the horrors of her own commands, but from the way her followers had carried them out. Hoskiv despised squeamishness, and so she should be pleased that, despite Ludlove's treachery, every other witch hunter had obeyed her, and none of them had violated any of the codes, but still, there had been glee in some of their eyes. That troubled her. She didn't know what it implied, but it was... The cardinal turned his head towards her. His eyes still had the same frozen, panicked expression, but they looked straight at her now, piercing her with the fright inside of them. He trembled and wheezed. His thin fingers dug into his sheets like he was trying to hold on to something. Tears were welling up in his eyes, and the veins in his temples rose to the surface. None. No bis. Nothing followed. His back arched and his bony hands made one last attempt to grab onto life on his bedsheets. Then all the candles in the room were simultaneously extinguished, without so much as a whisper. Lady Hoskiv sat alone in the dark, as the scent of molten wax was carried to her nostrils. So it had happened then. No successor. She bowed her head. She wanted to remain seated. Rising from this chair would mean facing seven peaks without a mayor and without a cardinal. It would mean that she would have to rise up and leave this room as the sole leader of the world's greatest city. And she didn't want to do that just yet. Mundus non nobis, she thought to herself. Mundus non nobis. It was frighteningly close to Sancta Gwendala's Mundus non vobis ad pertinit. But vobis meant you. The cardinal had used nobis. Nobis meant us. Mundus non nobis ad pertinit. The world does not belong to us. The sky was overcast, but Samina thought it was already afternoon when she woke up. Her head hurt and her muscles were stiff, but she was alive. She crawled up, her entire body aching. This was probably what it felt to be a truly old woman. The witch hunter was still sitting there, looking at her with that mixture of protective concern and awe. She wasn't sure whether to be charmed or annoyed. I'm fine, and I really think we should go, Ludlov. This is our only option, you said, and while I know nobody ever comes here, we're still walking about in the open. Of course. He got up. I was just about to suggest the same thing. 
He patted some dirt from his gloves and coat and entered the drainage pipe. Then he turned to her. Come on, into the mouth of the dragon. The sewers beneath Seven Peaks were a complex system of tunnels where it was easy to lose track. Ludlov claimed he knew the way, though, regaling Semina with tales of enemies he had pursued here, including creatures that hadn't had any other place to call home than this dark, dank, lonely abode. Semina still felt a bit sore after her magical exertion, but she insisted on maintaining a steady pace nevertheless. She wanted to get out of this place as quickly as possible. It wasn't the smell that bothered her so much, but the stone. Everywhere around them, there was cold, hard stone. It made her think of death. Here and there, a pale ray of sunlight managed to make its way down through a grid above. She didn't know how, but Ludlov seemed to be able to navigate through these tunnels using those grids as points of recognition. We are now beneath the city proper, where the people live. The smell's going to get worse now. He was right. The journey was not pleasant, but at least it didn't take too long. Eventually they reached a dead end where a metal ladder led to a grid above. Raindrops fell from the grid and made a musical sound as they ended their journey from the sky down here in the sewers. The daylight was now almost gone. Luckily, there was nobody to be seen in the dark alley where they emerged at last. The air there suddenly felt fresh and clear after the sewers. Measly raindrops clattered down onto the cobbled street. The buildings looming over them on both sides were large windowless warehouses and workshops. Farther on, near the corner of the street, there was a colourful shop sign. A single cheerful element in a dispiriting scene. It was impossible to read from a distance, but when they came nearer, Semina could finally make out what the sign said. Gustav Finsterdunkel's wondrous emporium of occult devices and sundry artifacts of the bizarre. So that was this week's episode of Witch Hunter. We'll be back next Thursday with the adventures of Ludlov and Samina. If you want to find out more about Witch Hunter, you can find us at audio-epics.com and we also have a Facebook page, the Audio Epics Facebook page. Have a great week, everyone.